Whoa! Hey, quit making me fall. Adventure KP. He's solving riddles great and small. Adventure KP. Adventure Capes, he loves the ball. Every day is a new quest, exploring north, south, east, to west. Point and click to find the answers that we seek. Adventure Game Geek. Hello there, fellow adventurers. Today is a special day. Why you ask? Because I'm going to take a look at a game from the beloved King's Quest series, which had a profound influence on my adventure gaming life. If you didn't already know, King's Quest VI Air Today Gone Tomorrow was developed by Sierra and released in 1992. It was written by the reigning queen of adventure gaming herself, Roberta Williams, along with Jane Jensen, also known for her work on Gabriel Knight. It originally came on no less than nine three and a half inch floppy disks and later on CD-ROM. Isn't that amazing that all of this fits on one of these? Next thing you know, we'll be downloading games from the internet. The introduction shows our hero Prince Alexander pining for his love Princess Cosima, both of whom spent a few precious moments together at the end of King's Quest V. But that's another story. All we really need to know right now is that Alexander will stop at nothing to find her. Unfortunately, Cosima forgot to give him her address, so Alexander set sail from his home in Daventry to search for his one true love. Land ho! Land ho! Land ho! Suddenly a tempest sweeps in and dashes the ship on the rocks, and the prince is shipwrecked. Pam from Cannot Be Tamed asks if there's a King's Quest game where you wake up on a beach. Well, I'm pretty sure this is it. We find ourselves on the Eye of the Crown, part of an archipelago that together makes up the land of the Green Isles. This first island is the home of the royal family, but instead of the king and queen, Alexander encounters vizier Abdul al Hazred, who invites him into the castle for tea and crumpets. Okay, just kidding. He pretty much tells you to bugger off. It would be best that you leave before there is any further embarrassment. The shifty looking guy in the background is the genie Shamir Shamazel, who looks pretty badass here, but he's actually a goofball who gets drunk on mints. <laughs> You fool! You've been eating those mints again! I ordered you to stop that! Yes. <laughs> Master! See that glint in his eye? Watch out for that, because Shamir will show up several times and attempt to lure Alexander into a trap. Come on over here and see what I'm doing with these flowers. Never mind that stone fella on top of the gate. He won't hurt you any. Oh, he seems pretty friendly. <laughs> Oh, he's not friendly at all! He's mean! Oh, he killed us! <laughs> Sometimes he'll appear as an animal to spy on Alexander. Travelling between islands is made possible by using a magic map you can trade for in the pawn shop, which has many curious items on display, some of which are references to previous King's Quest games. Cat cookie mix. Play tricks on your friends, the box says. Tongue climbing gear. Tested on over 100 whale tongues. A bridge repair kit, for when you've crossed a bridge one too many times. Let's travel to the Isle of Wonder, guarded by five gnomes that represent the five senses. Trilly dilly, use your hands. Is it beast or is it man? Sorry, that gnome with the giant hands really creeps me out. He looks like he's about to fondle Alexander. Alexander should limit his fondling to the lamps. There's no fondling like that in this game though. It's more like a fairy tale full of magic and wonder where you can even talk to tomatoes. Good day, tomato vines. Good morning. Not all tomatoes are friendly though. What are you staring at there, boy? Go away, you rootless thing, you. Yeah. Oh, I get it. He's a rotten tomato, so he has a rotten attitude. You're ugly and you smell bad. Yeah, put me down before I juice all over you. Ew. When you first arrive on the Isle of the Sacred Mountain, your way is blocked by what's known as the Logic Cliffs. In order to climb them, you need to consult this guidebook to the land of the Green Isles, which serves as the game's copy protection and gives you clues on how to solve the riddles of the cliffs. 
Only those pure of heart will be able to rise the cliffs of logic. Hmm. If you have a digital copy of the game, you can read all this in PDF format, but for me it's not the same as having a physical copy that you can imagine taking with you on your adventures. Even with the guidebook, however, Alexander can easily put a foot wrong. When you die, you appear literally at death's door, accompanied by Sierra's trademark gag message. Next. That wasn't a very logical step. Death is not the end, however, as long as you have a save game, and as the game tutorial says, it's always wise to save often. This is excellent advice, and I recommend putting post-it notes around your monitor to help you remember. At the top of the cliffs is the city of the Winged Ones, who take you to their lord and lady. The prophecy predicts that whosoever climbs the Cliffs of Logic will defeat the Minotaur. Great, so we climbed all the way up here and now our reward is to be thrown into the catacombs to face the Minotaur? Here's where the save often rule is a lifesaver because now you're trapped in the catacombs and if you don't have all the items you need to get out, you're in what's called an unwinnable state. Or in other words... It's a trap. The doors have sealed Alexander inside. And the ceiling is coming down. Oh wait, I've seen this before in a movie. I know what to do. The skull is caught between two cogs. Uh-oh! Yikes! Well, never mind. I'm sure we'll fare better against the Minotaur. I'll take care of the Minotaur, my lady. Have no fear. Now you die! I Hmm, what was that about saving often again? On the Isle of the Beast, we meet a funny creature whose speech sounds real familiar. Strange, my speech is not eloquence I speak with. As its name suggests, this island is the home of Beast, who just like in a certain other story, is a prince under an enchantment. Unfortunately, we'll be turned into a beast ourselves if we don't find a maiden to break the spell. A beast so hideous, it'll make you run away screaming in terror. Wee, 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 wee! Was that the beast you could do? If you bring beauty to the beast, the spell is broken and he transforms back into a prince, wearing what looks like an iceberg lettuce. And they lived happily ever after. <coughs> Apart from the lettuce, which melted. The final place we can visit is the realm of the dead, which can be reached by riding a horse called Nightmare. Let's try talking to the locals. Who are you, poor undead creatures? <sighs> I see. How interesting. Now we come to a familiar scene we've seen many times before, but this time let's brighten things up with a tune. Now we just need to cross the river Styx. Wait, did we pick up the coins from the skeleton in the catacombs? Yeah, did I mention save often? The final sequence where Alexander sneaks into the cast of the crown is most interesting because it can be played out in different ways. For example, you can either enter the castle by casting a magic door spell, or disguise yourself as a serving woman and sneak in through the front door. Capturing the genie Shamir is dependent on whether you made friends with Jollo the court jester earlier in the game. Please stop, Prince Alex! <laughs> I'm really ticklish! <laughs> You'll also have to choose the right lamp from this lamp cellar, which you should be able to identify if you paid close attention to the cutscenes with the genie. Ah, a fine choice, my son. The final duel with our Hazrid is an epic fight to the death, and they even start punching each other. <laughs> kind of violent for a King's Quest game. Alexander isn't a murderous blackguard like our Hazrid, though, and spares his life, and he's taken away to one of the cells where his only companion is this spider. Of course, the heroic prince always wins out in the end and marries his beloved princess. Do you have a ring? <laughs> Unless he left his wedding ring in the pawn shop. The end credit song is Girl in the Tower, which I previously sang along to in my Torin's Passage review. I'm reaching out, please tell me what to do. The box comes with a list of all these radio stations and their phone numbers to call up and request that they play the song. Let's give my local radio station a call. Hello? Yes, uh, I'd like to request Girl in the Tower from King's Quest 6. You're ugly and you smell bad! Yeah!
In summary, this game still keeps its charm for me even after all these years, and it's a great example of point-and-click adventuring at its best. It has a timeless quality like all good fairy tales, and I'd happily pick it up and play it any day. Well, that's it for King's Quest VI, folks. There's a lot of adventure games I like to review, but which one should I do next? What's this? I guess Christmas came early this year. Well, let's open it up and see what it is. Oh wow, King's Quest Seven. Okay, well, I guess I'll do this one next. Hooray! Oh wow. It's there. Oh cool. King's Quest Seven. Oh great. It's King's Quest Seven. Well, I guess I'll review this one next. <laughs> <laughs>